Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Make Money Your Honey podcast. I am here with a financial trailblazer for women, Sharon Lecter. Thank you so much for coming on the Make Money Your Honey podcast. I'm delighted to be with you, Amanda. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so in case there's some people in the audience who may not know who you are, we are we are financial nerds around here, many of us. But just in case somebody does not know who Sharon Lecter is, who is Sharon Lecter and how did she get here? Well, I started my career as a CPA in a large public accounting firm. About the ripe old age of 25, I was working crazy hours, and I realized how smart my parents had been because they were entrepreneurs. And so I started my entrepreneurial journey at 25. I started and sold a woman's magazine. I met the inventor of the first talking children's book and grew that industry around the world with partnering with little companies like Disney, Warner Brothers, Sesame Street. And then we sold that company in 1991. About that time, my husband and I relocated to Arizona and our oldest son went off to college and came home in December of 1992 in credit card debt. We didn't even know he had credit cards. And so that was December of 1992 and when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education, entrepreneurship education, helping people take control of their financial lives. Because it's a real simple thing. Too many people chase exchange time for money. Yes. I want people to change their mindset to instead of spending time and exchanging time for money, let's invest our time in buying, building, creating assets, my favorite word on earth. And one of my most recent taglines is assets are sexy. That's what we need to be focusing on, not income, but assets that generate that income. And so I started working with school systems, hence the white hair. Fast forward a few years, I met Robert Kiyosaki, who had gone to see my husband to help with some patent work. Because of my background, I, I met him at the first beta test of the board game cash flow. It was the only one that got out of the rat race. And I told him, I said, you know, I volunteered to help him bring it to market. And in that process, he told me he wanted to charge $195 for it. And I said, that's pretty pricey. Maybe you should write a brochure about the philosophy. And that's when he asked me to become his partner. And so Robert and I were partners for 10 years. So we wrote 15 books together. Our first book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, came out in April of 1997. So we're coming up on 25 year anniversary of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But that was the beginning of, of a 10 year partnership relationship and 15 books we wrote together. And then in 2007, he wanted to go into franchising. I didn't agree with the model. It was great for us, but not for the franchisee. So I made the decision to leave Rich Dad at the height of our success. We're not really knowing what was in front of me. So I always tell people, sometimes you have to close the door for other doors of opportunity to open. And as a result, a few months later, I got a phone call from President Bush and he asked me to be on the very first President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy. An incredible honor. Would not have had that call had I still been at Rich Dad. And I served both President Bush and President Obama. A few months later, got another phone call from the Napoleon Hill Foundation. So I read Think and Grow Rich when I was 19. Never realized the impact it had on me until I was in my 30s. But we know what was happening to the economy in 2008. And the foundation called to ask me to help reinvigorate the teachings of Napoleon Hill. Another huge honor. Another phone call I would not have had had I still been a rich dad. So I always challenge my listeners, my viewers, is there a door in your life you need to close so other doors will open? And that started a long and currently still very active relationship with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I've written four books in cooperation with the foundation, Three Feet from Gold, Think and Grow Rich for Women, Outwitting the Devil, and Success in Something Greater. Great relationship. And it's just been an incredible journey. And then most recently, I took a lot of the information. I've done a lot of the courses that I have and partnered with the top business broker in the country, female business broker. And we wrote Exit Rich, which was in cooperation with Inc. Magazine. And so that came out um, in the middle of 2021. And I'm in the process of doing a real estate course. So I'm, con I'm people say, you know, when are you going to retire? And I go, I don't think I ever will, because I'm always, my goal is as strong today as it was in December of 92, to provide people the tools, the resources, and the education they need to take control of their financial life and create financial stability and financial freedom in their lives. 
Wow. Wow. Okay. What an honor to have you here. And you did a very good job of condensing that. I can tell you're a professional at this. Um, I have a question for you. Um, It's a little off topic, but when I was a financial writer, I fell into it because of the Great Recession, actually. And at the time, a lot of people ended up in, a lot of bloggers ended up in careers in personal finance education at that time, because I have found that when, or I found back then, when things get crazy, suddenly everybody gets interested in their finances. We're kind of experiencing something like that now. You know, there was the inflation rates and just a whole lot, the student loan situation, and there's a lot going on. So as someone who's worked under two presidents, as someone who Um, just has done so much work in the financial education space. If someone is finding themselves being, man, this inflation is killing me. You know, the student loan decision is killing me. What advice would you have to people? Because it, it would seem, right? And it often seems like they just keep getting screwed (laughs) for lack of a better term. (laughs) Well, I think it's really important once, you know, if you recognize you're in trouble you know, the first thing is to stop digging. You know, most of us just dig a deeper hole. And it's really important to understand that, you know, things have changed a lot the last two years. Things that we thought we were in control of, we realized we were not. And so your financial life, you're where you are today because of the choices you made before today. And if you want something different in your life, you want something more, you want something more secure, you just, you need to start making different choices. And the biggest choice is to pay attention to who you listen to, because there's a ton of people out there giving advice that haven't earned the right. And so you have to make sure you're paying attention to who you're learning from, but get educated. And the first step is to figure out really where you are financially. And even if the picture is bleak, you're going to feel more confident because at least you know where you're starting from. And, um, you know, I, I have a money mastery program that was, is $1,500 on my website, but when the pandemic started, I slashed the price so that people could get it very, very inexpensive, well under $100. And you can go to mm.sharonlector.com to, to see that. But it really, it is to help people understand where they are, how to get their credit fixed, how to get out of the debt, how to concentrate on that mindset. Because most of us developed a mindset of scarcity. And that's going to hurt you your entire life. You're afraid you're never going to have enough money. And then when you get some, you're afraid you're going to lose it. So it's really important to work on the mindset as well as your money habits. And it's important to make sure that you are listening and learning from the right people. That is, that is great advice. So one of the the books that you wrote or co-wrote was Cashflow Quadrant. Mm -hmm. And I have to be honest with you, Sharon, when I was a financial writer, first of all, I think my dad gave me the audio version of Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was like 15. And I did not know what I had on my hands because I never finished it. (laughs) I don't think my dad really knew what he had on his hands either. (laughs) I think my parents had joined a network marketing company and they were like, read this book. And I don't know if he even ever finished it, but I remember getting the audio version and I I just, I didn't know. (laughs) I don't think my dad knew either. And then I remember, you know, falling, not falling into financial writing because I was, I was so curious because I was. I was one of the ones who couldn't find a job and I was struggling financially. And I was like, I have to learn this. Like you have to learn this in order to survive and thrive in the world. And that would start an eight year career as a writer. It took me about six years to come across and understand the cash flow quadrant, which completely changed my life. I ended up, you know, torching the freelance business and then going into marketing and sales training because I saw the need and it was more scalable. So what is the cash flow quadrant for those who do not know? And how can we use it to build wealth? Yeah, definitely. The cash flow quadrant really digs into the mindset about money. And it's, it's, you know, four quadrants and the top left is E for employee. And the bottom left is S for self-employed or small business person. So the left side of the quadrant E and S is all about school. It's all about you. It's all about you exchanging time for money, you working for money. And so the issue with that is that's what school teaches us. 
The problem is how much money can you make? This amount of money is finite because there's only so many hours in the day, only so many days in the week. The right side of the cash flow quadrant, the top quadrant is B for business owner, and the bottom right is I for investor. So the right side of the quadrant is not taught in school, is taught in the world of hard knocks. Becoming a business owner and investor means your money is working for you. You are investing your time in buying, building, creating income producing assets. And those assets generate income for you, which gives you your time back. And how much money can you make on the right side of the quadrant? Infinite. I sit before you, I still make money out of all four quadrants. I am an employee of my own company. I'm a self-employed speaker, so I get paid for speaking. I'm a business owner. My husband and I own multiple businesses and multiple investments. We make far more money on the right side of the quadrant than we do on the left. But that is all about mindset. On the left side is safety, security, again, the rat race, all right, being on that treadmill and exchanging your time for money and hope that at the end of the day, you have enough money to pay your bills. The right side is you are really taking the time, investing yourself in building a business that is a true business, not a job. Way too many business owners own a job, not a business. So we, my, my superpower is helping people move from owning a job that they think is a business into a real business with systems and with other people's money, time and resources that help you create that asset, that business that works for you, that eventually you have the ability to get your time back. And then taking that cash flow and investing it in investments, passive investments, long-term investments that again, become your employees without, without the drama and of their personalities. So you want to work towards the right side of the quadrant. That's you're financially free when the income from your assets exceeds your monthly expenses. It doesn't have to be millions of dollars. So think about what you spend every month and then think about how can I get enough assets to generate that kind of revenue? It's, I got stuck in the self-employed space when I was a writer, and uh, I see a lot of women business owners get stuck here. I feel like a lot of us start, especially after the, the Great Recession. I mean, we're seeing the Great Resignation now, but I was like, I saw that in 10 years ago. This has been coming for a long time. <laughs> it's just a tidal wave now. And I feel like a lot of us start businesses, uh, you know, the, the most common things I hear is we want more flexibility. So we can be there for our families and things like that. The financial freedom, the, the opportunity for that, of course. Uh, and we just don't want jobs. <laughs> but what ends up happening a lot of time, it happened to me. And it happens to a lot of our, our uh, students. And we have to help them start thinking differently. Is that no one taught us about scaling or exit strategy. It was not even a conversation being had. So a lot of us end up in positions, like you said, where we end up building a job for ourselves. And as someone who did that and then had to figure out how to get out of it, and it was probably the most difficult three years of my life <laughs> trying to get out of that, I now am like, no, we should be having the conversation about exit from the beginning, regardless of what kind of business you're starting. I know you're doing that now. You have a new book out called exit rich. So why is it that, that we have to start thinking about exit and why, why don't we, why does this seem like some far off distant concept a lot of the time? Well, most of the time when you start a business, you're passionate about what you're doing, you're solving a problem, serving a need. So you rush out with a product or service and you start bringing in money and you start marketing and you don't take the time to build the foundation for your business. And that's what causes you it, prevents you from being able to scale. You need to have the foundation of your business. We talk about the six P's in the book, Exit Rich. And again, this is what we did in cooperation with Inc. Magazine. And Steve Forbes says it's a goldmine for entrepreneurs because entrepreneurship used to be a dirty word not too long ago. And now everybody's an entrepreneur. The issue is, right. are you an entrepreneur truly building a business or are you an entrepreneur creating your own job? And most people create their own job. And you ask somebody that starts a business, are you starting your business to A, work until the day you die, 
or B, to build something that's successful that provides you financial security and eventually gives you your time back? B, most everyone, 100% of the people say B, but the vast majority of people build A and they don't understand how to build that foundation. So that's why we wrote Exit Rich. It's not about selling your company only. It's about starting and building your company with the understanding that it asks to build that business as a true asset that could be sold one day. These are the things that you need to do now. And the, the six P's, as I mentioned, you know, the first one is your people. If you're the only one working your business, it's going to be hard to sell. So do you have the right people around you, the right team? Do you have the right mentor, a mentor who helps steer you around pitfalls, accelerates your growth? Do you have people on your team who are strong where you are weak? And then the second one is your products. You know, many times somebody has a single product or service that could be um, turned into six or taken into different industries. So let's define what your products and services are. And the third one is really the, the miracle of scalability and that's processes, your business systems. That's what allows, that's the biggest difference between a job and a business. Do you have a system? Thinking of McDonald's, you know, teenagers are running it. Every step of your business, it is a lot easier to manage a process than it is to manage a personality. And too many times people create a job around a personality. No, you need to create the jobs that you need for your business to run effectively and then have people fill those roles. And when they don't do something appropriately, if you have it written out as what the process is, it's a lot less emotional if you just say, okay, let's look at the process, what went wrong, rather than accusing them of not doing something right. So it's easier to build from a, from a structural and scalability perspective when you have the right business processes. And the fourth one is proprietary. That's your intellectual property, your competitive advantage, understanding that every aspect of your business can provide you competitive advantage. And though that value is huge. And it's not on your balance sheet. So it's best to identify that and know what that is. Why do people buy from you and not someone else? Is it your, it's not just your brand and your logo, but it's your competitive advantage. And those intangible assets are more and more valuable every single day. Um, 40 years ago, Fortune 500 companies were 85% um, bricks and mortar, 15% into intellectual property, intangible assets. Today, that's more than flipped. It's probably closer to 90% intangible assets and 10% bricks and mortar. Wow. And, and you so, see that in valuations, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you think of Airbnb, one of the largest hospitality companies, they own no hotels. Um, uh, Uber, one of the largest transportation companies, they own no cars. Yeah. So I mean, the, we Amazon. Work with, we work with, I mean, that's probably a bad example, but that crazy valuation for WeWork, I think a lot of it was based on their brand right and yes. people were like what how is this worth this much <laughs> they don't even make money and their competitor makes money how is we well, worth and i think they based what it on facebook the brand. paid for you know what instagram the two of them i mean you look at it and you go wow and that that's intangible assets and that's competitive advantage and so it's really important to understand that that's the, the proprietary the fifth p is patrons and we talk about social media. Um, so many people brag about their social media reach. And I go, the issue is you may have a million followers on Instagram. You may have 500,000 on Facebook. How many of them are in your database? Because right. that's the social media is a great lead generation tool, but invite them home, get them into your database because those add value to you that gives you that intellectual property it increases your valuation and it gives you control over communicating with them and then the last p is profit and most people are too focused on product and profit and they don't understand to really build a business that's not just successful but one that is sustainable and scalable you have to have all six p's that that's brilliant. I, when I started scaling my business like three years ago, I I love that a lot more people are talking about it now. Maybe people noticed the need was there because there's so many resources now. I mean, um, I work with or uh, Brandon and Natalie Dawson. Oh my gosh, they have been so helpful to me. 
with as uh, Natalie in particular with understanding people because that's like a learning curve in and of itself <laughs> the people one uh, so to your point about people and finding the right mentors how does somebody find the right mentors because one of the issues um, I'm seeing in my space you know and I teach sales is a lot of people um there's been this trend happening where I will talk to women who spent, I don't know, 35, 40, $50,000, right. On people who were not the right fit. And then they're making themselves, there's a lot of shame around that. So I guess it's a two part question. One, how do we make sure we're picking the right mentors? And two, if we didn't, if we made a mistake, which everybody does, how can we get past all this shame that a lot of women are feeling about that? Yeah, a mistake is an occurrence, not a definition. And too many women, you know, try and wear it like a big sack of potatoes over their back. And everybody makes mistakes. The question is, are you learning from it? And it's really important to find a mentor, but it's also important to do your homework and to see who they are, what their reputation is, who else they mentor, what your field of business is, and, and to make sure that they've got the, the, the history and the experience. Because there's a big difference between coaches and mentors. Both are important, but a coach is going to keep you accountable to a predetermined path. And um, they're going to keep you accountable. A mentor is someone who's going to step into your business and step into your world and use their experience and their connections to help you grow your business. Very different functions. I am an excellent mentor. I love the one-on-one -on -one clients I have. I am not a great coach. Um, I have people on my team who serve as coaches. And so you want to make sure you find the right person to, that supports you and where you want to go. I've been involved in a lot of different businesses, a lot of different industries. So I have clients from a lot of different, different industries, but I'm very selective. Um, we have a process. Even you go to my website, there's a questionnaire. We very selective because there's only so many hours I can donate to it, dedicate to one-on-one -on -one mentoring and they have, they're my highest priority. And so it's something that I, because that's on the left side of the quadrant, we go back to the quadrant. I choose to do the mentoring because it fills my heart. I love helping people get to that next level. I help people move from the left side to the right side. But in doing that, I go back to the left side. That's where I, in order to do that as a mentor, but I love it. So I choose to do it. And it's something that you want when you're looking for a mentor, you need to find somebody who's doing it because they enjoy it. They want to invest in you. They want to step into your world, not just sell you theirs. Oh, that's really good. I think there's a lot of people selling their worlds to, to women and then yeah, it's, it's turning a little nasty. It's getting a little, there's, it, there's a, there's a lot of noise out there. Yeah. Tons of noise. And there's a lot of people that want you to pay them a lot of money because they're, you know, they're, they've got the private jets and they got the fancy cars and they want you to just be so jealous and, and FOMO that you'll write them a check thinking then that's going to give you the opportunity to build it on your own. You need to build it on your own. You're perfect and absolutely fantastic and fabulous the way you are but you need someone that's going to step into your world and say these are your assets let's see how we can create more assets let's create a income um, opportunity and an income stream that will allow you to become financially free not what's in my world right i can show you my ranch i can show you my beautiful home but i want to look at what you have and help support you to get what you need to become financially free so for those who may not know, uh, how would you define an asset and what are some examples of assets? Well, assets are, um, they are businesses, real estate, intellectual property, paper assets, stocks, bonds, and mutual fund, funds that work for you. Uh, cryptocurrency, okay, collectibles. Now that doesn't provide cash flow, but it, it hopefully will appreciate. These are things that provide you the opportunity to get that income every single month. So you buy a rental property, all right? You have a mortgage, but your tenant pays you $1,000 a month. Your mortgage is 500. You have cash flow $500 every month. In addition, you own 100% of the house. You own 100% of the appreciation, but you only had to put down 10, 20%. The bank gave you the money for it. So you've had total leverage. 
So assets provide income and they provide leverage and they provide appreciation. And that's where you've invested your time to buy, build, or create those assets. Intellectual property, writing a book, creating an online program. You invest the time and the energy and create the platform to set it up, set up the marketing, but you provide that information and then it's something that can build and create income for you over time. If someone is just getting started in the world of assets, do you have a recommendation for where someone should start? Well, it depends on what their goals are. Depends on what they want. Um, I'm very involved with a company called ULA. If they want to reach out to me, info at SharonLector.com. I can help support them going in the right direction. You want to know what your vision is, what your goal is. And do you want to start in real estate? Do you want to start by starting a business? Um, a lot of times you're employed. And so I, I go, well, you know, the first time is let's generate some cash flow. So become an affiliate of somebody you believe in and help support their business. And in doing that, you start creating a little extra cash flow and then use that cash flow to invest in assets, whether it be a business or real estate or, or stocks. And, and you know, you, a lot of people are, are teaching day trading and stocks. I, you know, I, when we say diversification, a lot of financial planners talk about diversification, but they usually talk about it amongst paper assets, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. When I talk about diversification, I talk about across all asset categories, all right, commodities, gold, silver, paper assets, real estate, businesses, that gives you the greatest flexibility because if one area goes down in a recession, you have the others that are going to support you. I was going to ask you what your thoughts are on gold, because I hear gold is starting to make some noise again because of all the inflation. So I was going to ask you what your thoughts were on that. Well, gold and silver are, you know, they are standard bearers. They're, they're standard bearers and they always will be. But, you, you know, people get too focused in one area and they lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is understanding all asset categories. You know, real estate obviously is an really short su supply, high demand, so prices are high. And yet, if you have some rental properties that are generating cash flow for you, you know, let you hang on to them, keep them growing. And you have the opportunity to build more and more. And you right now may not be the time to invest in office buildings because all of virtual working pe people, you know, but people always need a place to live. So Multifamily housing is really hot right now. As a result, storage facilities are hot. Industrial is hot. So again, but don't try to do it by yourself. Get, get within a group, understand, you know, learn from others as to what they're doing and how successful it is. And, and the other question in terms of investments is uh, crypto. What are your thoughts? People have very strong opinions about crypto. <laughs> what are your opinions on crypto? Well, I was out to dinner last night with three lawyers and they, two of them were black and white. You know, crypto is not going to last. Cryptocurrency is here to stay. The issue is right now it is very volatile. And so a lot of people feel like, oh, I got to invest in crypto. You know, invest only money you can lose or take the time and educate yourself and understand what you're investing in. You know, you can invest in crypto, you can invest in blockchain technology, you can invest in other industries that support that industry. You know, um, virtual money, cryptocurrency is here to stay. We just have to figure out how to educate ourselves on how to invest in it properly. Yeah, I have a confession to make. I was one of those financial writers on Twitter totally trashing Bitcoin <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, I've changed my mind. I have about 5%, just a small percentage, because I'm like, I don't know if this is a hedge or speculation or what is going on, but I've seen enough data where I'm like, yeah, there should probably be a little bit of money here. Just a little well, bit. That, what you just said is the question, is it a hedge or is it speculation? And on any given day, it's, it may be one and the next day it might be the other. So it's, yeah, exactly. We don't know. Yeah. And a hedge for those who don't know is, is kind of like store of value, right? It's store of value. So it's kind of like, a, okay, this is going to keep its value while fiat currency mm -hmm. because of inflation keeps being devalued. Okay. So I got that right. Yay. I still remember from my finance days. <laughs> <laughs> so another asset class that you talk about a lot, and I found this fascinating actually, because I didn't even think about this. Uh, it, and I've built a lot of intellectual property and I tell my clients all the time, you have to build intellectual property. I saw it as like, a, okay, this is going to be one of the easiest ways to scale. 
I didn't realize that um, it's actually one of the most valuable assets out there right now. And I'm not going to lie, I'm having a hard time conceptualizing why. So why is intellectual property considered so valuable? What about it makes it value extremely like what was the statistic like 85 90% of companies now well have- intellectual property that that includes and incorporates a lot of different things obviously books online programs but it's also the value of the brand um, you know the apple brand is the most valuable brand on earth we've got elon musk you know all the the, the valuation of those brands is huge and that's considered intangible Intangible assets include your logo, include your database, all right? Your database, the number of people you have in your database. Those, all that is intangible value. Um, if I say what company uses brown trucks, you know which company I'm talking about, UPS. Okay, that's built value in that company because of that recognition. Golden arches, okay, recognition. Used to be people would think that the, uh, you know, the trademark, um, Coca-Cola was the most valuable trademark on earth. Well, no, Apple, the little sweet, is far superior. So what every single day you can build intellectual property and it helps us level the playing field because you don't need the big bricks and mortar businesses and office buildings and locations. You can do it online. You can do it through building that value and reputation and platform. And it can be through a book, it can be through an online program, it can be through establishing a reputation and creating software. All of that is all intangible. So the vast majority of the world we live in right now, valuation comes from intangible assets. Yeah, I I actually remember hearing that Coca-Cola was like the most recognized uh, brand in the world, but you're right, it's probably Apple now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I I I think Coca-Cola even trademarked the red. (laughs) <laughs> that they use. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but I thought I'd heard something about that because you could go and the, the golden arches. I remember being in, in Rome um, and my brother and I, for whatever reason, just really wanted an American type meal. And we found a McDonald's in front of the Pantheon in Rome. It's like those golden arches. Everybody knows what they are. Doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. You know, when you see those golden arches, you found a McDonald's. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It is real. Uh, so, um, as we're wrapping this up, do you have any parting words for our audience? Because like I said, there is a lot going on right now. There's so many changes going on in the economy, so many changes going on in the marketplace. Do you, based on your experience being, you know, in this game for as long as you have, do you have any parting words? Well, certainly in my first book with the foundation, Three Feet from Gold, I released a personal success equation and it really kind of encapsulates everything and you go to personal success equation.com and it's a free download but it's really your passion your talent and that's where most of us stop because we think we have to do everything on our own my passion was anger that we weren't teaching kids about money in school my talent was i'm um, cpa for many years all my publishing experience and i could have combined that and stayed there and try to do it on my own but i understood the power of association so you have the p plus t times a power of association who's on your team who's your mentor who do you align with um, who helps you take your business to the next level and then times a taking action many times we know what we're supposed to do we just don't do it so passion plus talent times association times action plus faith f for faith having faith in yourself having faith in what you're doing having faith that it was needed and necessary and have faith that you will succeed and too many of us that f is fear and it's what holds us back we become our own stumbling blocks. And so when you have, and they usually go, when I start working with a new client, I go through this process with them. And it's usually their associations that they need to work on and their self-confidence, that faith. And they really go hand in hand. When you have the right mentor, you have the right people around you, it's hard, they won't let you stay down. All right, so your self-confidence and having the right people around you go hand in hand. So I recommend you all download personalsuccessequation.com and re- evaluate your own life. Who do you hang out with? What are you filling in your brain? What, what do you need to do to take yourself to the next level? And realize that you are uniquely you. You have a gift to give, no matter what stopped you in your tracks whatever you've been through, you're still here and you're still here for a reason and you have the opportunity. People can benefit from what you know. 
You know, I learned about that people one um, and associations, especially during 2020. Man, I cleaned house in 2020. I think a lot of people did. Uh, fortunately, I had already read a thing. <laughs> I call Think and Grow Rich one of my um, ish hit the fan books. So like whenever like I'm freaking out, I pull out Think and Grow Rich and I tell all my clients to do this. It calms me down. Like you're on the right track. Everything's okay. Everything's going to be fine. I pulled it out. Um, and, and I remember thinking in 2020, okay, I have to think the way wealthy people do. What are wealthy people going to do right now? They're going to go 10 times harder because they know their competition is going to fall off in the next couple of years right? Or they're going to find problems to solve in the marketplace. And they're going to get very, very um, strict about who it is that is in their network and in their orbit. And I remember having that realization in 2020, where I was like, oh, man, I really got to let go of some things from like the past in terms of associations. And I have to start putting myself in different rooms, even if they're virtual rooms. And I kept telling myself, which is probably not the financially smart thing, I don't care how much it costs. <laughs> I'm going to be in that room. So, you know, I remember I've been in 10X Ladies. I've worked with Michael Burt, which I know you know Michael Burt as well. You know, I was like, whatever I have to do, I have to get in the room with the right people. And I will tell you, it's made all the difference in the world. Well, it gives you resources. It gives you opportunities to ask the right questions and learn from people who've been there, done that. And yes, I love Michael Burt. I love um, you know Brandon and Natalie. They're fantastic. We work together on a very quick, often base. You know, we add value. They bring me in to talk to their community about intellectual property, about licensing. And it's something that's very important that you work together because this is the time when you need to collaborate, not compete. And um, you know, I just I value when somebody reaches out wanting to get support from a mentoring perspective. Um, it is very important that, that you support them in, in every aspect. You know, I work with them on every aspect of their life. And it's something that is important because people are struggling right now. And my mm -hmm. goal is to provide the resources and the tools to help them get their footing back and be able to create a better life. One final question I would love to get your perspective on because you you just I something just came through while you were saying people need you need to work on the whole person. One of the things I'm finding and, and a lot of my colleagues are finding is there's a lot of healing that needs to happen before people can really excel financially. Um, and there's a lot of that missing. I'm not sure if you've noticed it as well. I'm not sure if um you, you, because it's like you're saying, there's so much stuff going on in their heads, internally, emotionally, there, there's a lot of healing that needs to be done before they can kind of see the forest from the trees. I'm wondering if you've also noticed that. And if you have any advice for people who really are just like, where would you even start healing, <laughs> you know, in order to really, um, move, uh, make some financial moves. Right. Well, um, this new, I mentioned that I'm working with a new company and I've been their mentors for seven years and we've got over 3 million people that have joined us this in the last few months. And I, and I really love it because it is, it, it talks about the whole life. It looks at, um, your family, your faith, your friends, your finance, your fitness, your field, your business and fun, having fun in your life. So the whole person is what we look at and go through and determine where you are, where you want to be, and then setting goals and having that AI um, is AI driven because specific packets of, of information come to you for where you are and where you want to go. And it's helping people find that footing and find every single day they're getting support to making them taking the next step. And so I'm happy to provide you some information about that. You can go to um, my ULA dot ulalife.com forward slash Sharon for more information because I it's something that I believe so strongly in that has helped is helped my husband and I this year and has helped so many people find their footing because the world is changing around us. This one comes to you and says, where are you right now? Where do you want to be? How can we support you in finding the next step to help you in that healing process? I love that. All right. For where can everybody find you? You have so many things going on. So let the people know where they can find you, what you've got going on. Well, first of all, just on in 22. Yeah. <laughs> Info at SharonLector.com. 
and you can tell me whether you're interested in, in our in the life goal setting um, in the personal success equation. If you're interested in real estate, just reach out to me, info at Sharon Lecter, telling me what it is you'd like, and we can support you on your next step. All right. Thank you so much for being here and honoring us with your wisdom. Um, and guys, make sure to check out every resource Sharon has, because I'm telling you, it is a wealth of wisdom. And if you want to learn what the wealthy people do, go learn from the wealthy people and go learn from people who are around wealthy people all the time. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. It's my honor, Amanda. And thank you for doing this because as us, we all just need to come together and help each other.